Okay, very good morning to uh, students, all of you. So today I'm going to continue talking about uh, environment sampling, specifically on the sampling and monitoring of emission air. So these are the uh, contents of uh, our lecture today. So there will be a few calculation uh, for us to, 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 to learn. Uh, before we go into uh, learning the types of uh, CEMs or what they call continuous emission monitoring system. And uh, at the end of this lecture, we're going to learn a little bit about the sampling and also analysis. You may find uh, a lot of similarities between today's lesson and also those from last week. Uh, but but majority of the things that uh, you're going to learn today, I will be highlighted like at the end of our lesson. So let me start by introducing to you what is uh, emission sampling. So the name itself shows you that the uh, air sampling that we're talking about here coming from the point source. So it is emitted lah, yeah. So these air pollutants, as you can see right here, PM. So PM could be PM 2.5, PM 10, those particulars with 2.5 and 10 micrometer uh, in, in, in diameter. Um, sulfur dioxide, NOx, sulfur monoxide, and sulfur dioxide, and also carbon monoxide. Now these are the gases that we have learned last week, and also we also learned how it is sampled and analyzed using chemical way and also uh, spectroscopy. These gas are emitted by plus because of the uh, mostly due to the uh, combustion activity. As long as you have combustion, these are the ones that are going to pop up. Yeah. So it is performed online by in situ continuous emission monitoring system, or in this case we call it CEMS. Now this system it could be in situ or it could be uh, ex situ. Well. Um, it is not called ex situ, but there's another word for it. They call it extracted CEM. So why this is uh, always referred to online and in situ? This is because uh, for practicality and also uh, uh, reliability. Because why? When a factory, a plant, a factory of a plant or in operation, we all know that this plant operates continuously 24-7 if possible. Only a very few times it will be like stopped for maintenance or whatsoever. Usually plants do not stop. So because of that, a robust and reliable system have to be set up in order to uh, gather information regarding the quality or how how, how bad is the, is the uh, contaminants contained in their emission sample, yeah? So in here, stack sampling and continuous monitoring is needed for very obvious reason. The sampling and analysis has to be conducted so that they know the concentration of the pollutants, but it also serves as these reasons, lah, yeah? To confirm that the online measurement is correct, so you have a system in place to monitor the pollutants. However, it is it is obvious lah, yeah, when a system uh, are working for such a long time, the sensitivity may be different. I mean, obviously, whatever that have worked for a long time needs to be checked from time to time to measure its uh, accuracy. Yeah. Okay, next one is to examine the applicability of new detector or facility function as designed. Now, if there is an installation or you put in new detector or new equipment, uh, this has to be tested. Lah, yeah? And number three, to examine any release of pollutants in case of public complaint. Uh, this one doesn't happen all the time, but if it does, the public may also give you a reason to, to conclude because if there is no concrete answer or you don't examine and provide them with a favorable answer it might end up ugly because why the public can complain once they complain to doe and that's it the officers will come check everything and not only you're going to have a tough time trying to convince them and and, and do a lot of preparation to yeah to to handle these doe officers 
I mean, worst come to worst when they when they manage to find your mistake. Okay, they find a uh, uh, violation violation of the uh, of the of the air quality standard. They can issue you a fine, not just only a fine. If the uh, violation is too severe and you and, and, and it's needed for you to be present in the court, then a lot of uh, penalties might be subjected, including jail term. That is a possibility, but most of the time it's just fine. Lah. But when you talk about this fine, lah, it's not like DBKL5, just a, a few hundred. No, it could be a uh, 10,000, 100,000, and it could be up to 1 million because the minister from the last government, the last Malaysian government, has already increased increased the fines yeah, for uh, polluters. Okay, and finally, to determine the pollutants not measured online, such as mercury, ammonia, hydrogen chloride, and etc. So for those, uh, there are some contaminants that cannot be measured by online in situ method. So there are another technique, lah, yeah. So if it's not on measured, then like I said to you just now, the second way of CEMS is the extracted CMS, in which there will be more like, examples that I can show you regarding the uh, sampling methods and also how the sampling, how how the how the gas collected by the extracted CEMS can be used to analyze all these like, all these pollutants that cannot be measured by continuous in situ online. Uh, uh, online institute continuous emission monitoring system. So, oh yeah. By the way, I think uh, let me check. Um, do you all know what this uh, stack word means? The stack sampling. Do you know what is stack? Can anybody answer? I just want to check whether you understand or not. Uh, anybody stack. knows? Yeah. Uh, location where smoke emitted. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, another word for stack. Anybody knows? Example, uh, Example of stack. <laughs> actually, for those who don't know what stack means, lah, it actually means a chimney. Yeah, every factory will have a chimney like this kind to like channel the polluted uh emi i mean the, the emission gas are relatively higher in concentration up higher in the atmosphere so that they can release on top so from the point of the release it will start disperse so the concentration of the pollutants will come down to a acceptable level so that is like chimney lah, you can call it okay so i hope you understand what I said because this word will be used uh intermittently during this lecture so so that is what I mean. Eh? Now, before we continue into the techniques, so we need to know lah, the regulation. So what standards are we using? So in terms of emission standard, there is a provision under Environmental Quality Act 1974 and uh, with a revision in 1978. I think there is another one with 8084, if not mistaken. But if you want to know, you can just easily Google emission standard EQA Malaysia, you will have a few more uh, lecture slides are uh, delivered by third party, or better still, go to a bookshop. You can go, you can easily buy this uh, this uh, the booklet uh, of, of this so called EQA, okay, with specific uh, provisions under this uh, clean air environmental uh, quality clean air regulation. It can be it can be obtained like, in any bookstore. So here, um, oh, by the way, it's not 1984, yeah? So the revision uh, with specific uh, revision on the uh, clean air regulation is actually revised in 2014. It's quite recent. Not exactly very new, but it's quite new. Uh, yeah, because if you look back, it's only eight years old. And I believe there are more to come. And I think you might be remember the last time, not just a few years ago, when uh, there is an incident that many uh, uh, foreign plastic, foreign plastic were imported to Malaysia, kononya uh, lah, may purportedly for recycling purpose, but ended up they are not actually being recycled. For your information, many of the so-called recycler 
were actually disposer, to be more specific. So they were given a load of recycled plastic. They were needed to melt it. But the fact is that many of these so-called recycled plastic are not fit for recycle. So what they do, they already receive this plastic card. And they cannot just simply dump it into the landfill because they lose money. So what they do, they burn. During that time, la, the, the air quality is quite severe and there are a lot of complaints la, locally. It depends on, on, on places. La. Not all the not the entire Malaysia is in this trouble. But what I can say la, during that time, Klang. Klang have many of these uh, polluters and they were the one la, who causes the next revision. La. I'm not sure exactly whether it has been enacted or not, but I believe that the penalties la, have been increased. So in this schedule, they have a, a few keywords la, like uh, TEQ. TEQ means toxicity equivalent quotient. So that is the uh, the value la, derived with comparison to TCDD, 2378 TCDD to be exact. Uh, because this compound is said to be the, the most toxic form of dioxin. No other dioxin is more toxic than this one. So they they measure the toxicity of other dioxin or pollutants coming from emission against 2378 TCDD. So those are the uh, a little bit information lah, uh, regarding how toxicity are measured. But nonetheless, I think maybe you don't have to worry too much like your exam. Lah, yeah. So once again, uh, there are a lot of like activities that uh, is referred to this standard because the level of pollution is not the same because it will be subjected to what kind of uh, activities in the plant and based on those activities the standard the permissible level also may be different so here we look at power and heat generation so i think this is very obvious lah. all power plant in malaysia emit a lot of pollutants and in fact, that is the major source of air pollutants are in Malaysia, apart from your uh, combustion vehicle. So why I say combustion vehicle, just a few days ago, uh, I've watched the news, like business news. Nowadays, all auto car show, that means any exhibition in the world or in region, showing recent or latest cars like, to the public, you can say the like, majority of them already con are already moved to EV, electric vehicle, or yeah, electric vehicle, or energy or EEV, energy efficient vehicle. So when we talk about energy efficient vehicle, you may still see some combustion engine and they may emit less pollutants, but EV, electric vehicle, is the new or future trend. Uh, it's not going to be cheap. So in future, la, let's say Malaysia want to uh, fulfill its obligation of the uh, carbon emission. I, I, I believe la, in the near future, maybe in 20 years time, in 20 years time, all of you will have to buy EV. There will be no combustion vehicle at all. Yeah, because that is the source of uh, the pollution in, in, in the world. So now there's one thing that... Uh, you cannot avoid, la, we say you cannot avoid is that this EV will need power from somewhere else. And in Malaysia, you can say that quite a large fraction of electricity generated in Malaysia comes from power plant. So in terms of power generation in Malaysia, we use a lot of coal and a little bit of natural gas. And, and not only that, you can see boilers, not the boilers, they are the equipment used in the majority of the factories. They burn and generate heat for the operation of the factory. So when you look at the standards for boilers, they also look at uh, the capacity. So some boilers, they are very big, some of them very small. So based on this, the, uh, the pollutants also, okay, based on the pollutants, they come in different quantities. Some of the pollutants, they are of higher uh, limits. Some of them, they are not. And their monitoring methods also, uh, some of them very frequent, like uh, for sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, and also the NOx gas, 
the monitoring must be continuous. So, apa lagi? If you say continuous, kan? So, the CEMS required is, of course, have to be in situ. The one that I mentioned just now. Okay. Now, for other gases like hydrogen chloride, those are like less conventional. And I have to say the hydrogen chloride is less likely to appear in the gas, although it is one of the pollutants. But it's less likely to cause uh, trouble. So, periodically, it is required to be monitored. So it depends. Depends on what pollutants appeared, how frequent, and and what is the requirement like, as provided by Environmental Quality Act. So I think I'm going to uh, go really quick on this one, uh, except to tell you that this uh, Environmental Quality Act is majority based on US EPA reference method, and um, I just checked like actually. Last week, when I say there's one standard la, for uh, air quality with reference to United States, actually, lead is very much part of the pollutants la, that is determined in uh, the Malaysian air quality standard. And yeah, because it's, it, it follows exactly US EPS reference. La. Okay, another new term for you is the dry standard cubic meter. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, that means this is actually the volume, the va the volume of emission air that is uh, uh, at twenty five degrees Celsius. That is the um, ideal gas uh, or STP, like we call it, standard temperature and pressure at twenty five degrees. Celsius. So this is said to be the room temperature when this uh, standard is derived. Uh, of course, lah, in stack sampling, this is the chimney. It is not, it is not normal lah, to see a gas at 25 degrees Celsius. This is like air con air. Can you imagine air con air exists in chimney? Directly after the combustion chamber, which is not possible, lah, of course. Lah. Which is why we're going to have like a little bit of calculation to convert. Lah, because that is a standard that they assume in chimney at 25 degrees Celsius. Pressure at one atmosphere. Now this one more or less the same, lah. Except maybe you have it a little bit higher. So if it is, then you need to be corrected later. There is another equation. Um, and then there is another uh, another assumption. Yeah. So the emission standard show emission standard that are written in terms of concentration include the phrase corrected to seven percent oxygen. Now. Why 7% oxygen? Later, I think uh, there are slides to explain further. So the actual definition of DSCM, dry standard cubic meter, dry standard cubic meter means the volume at standard temperature and pressure without moisture. Oh yeah. So this is what I left out. No moisture. Because whatever that you sample, they assume that you only look at the gases or maybe the particulate. So moisture is not considered a pollutant here and should be excluded. Okay, so you might be asking me why why moisture should be excluded because I mean you also drink water, okay? so they are not counted like, as a as a part of the pollutants inside the emission. Okay, so so yeah, corrected to seven percent oxygen. Why do we need to make this correction? Isn't that you just look at the pollutants and then that's it? Well, apparently there is a there is a reason for it. Now, traditional combustion occurs at fifty percent or seven or fifty percent excess air or seven percent oxygen. Um, now, in the combustion uh, in in the combustion chamber of uh, any plant, they are like uh, they are so advanced that some combustion may even occur at a uh, lower oxygen level. So in this case, uh, there might be some variation in terms of the uh, pollutants emitter and whatnot. Uh, because in this case, it is said that if the oxygen level is higher than expected, uh, it is high, uh, if the oxygen level is higher than 7%, it is said that more NOx gas could be produced inside the stack. So they need to be co co being corrected. La. Too much of oxygen cannot, too low also cannot. So from here, it should be corrected so that 
the standard that we're using is comparable and can be compared with the uh, the level of pollution that is obtained uh, in the sampler okay so the co i mean the calculation the uh, the formula i would say the mathematical formula that you can use to do this correction is as shown right here where c core is the concentration corrected to 7% oxygen C D S C M is the concentration of corrected to dry static condition, and in this case, Y is the percentage of oxygen in flue gas, of course, under dry condition. So there are a lot of corrections that you need to do because inside the uh, gas, okay, the, uh, the the emission gas sample as you collected from the stack may varies depending on different combustion technology. And also, of course, the condition at that time of sampling. So there is one example that you can try. And I think, uh, oh, let me read you the question. So in this example, you were given a task to calculate, uh, to calculate uh, the, the so-called level, okay? The level of pollutants under STP, DSCM, and they ask you whether this level emitted by this uh, stack uh, adheres or met the standard. Okay, so here the first sentence mentioned that the PM, so here they're measuring PM, particulate matter, of 30 milligram per DSCM. So the standard wants the level of pollutants under DSCM volume. And uh, it is corrected to 7% of oxygen. Now, the in-situ stack monitoring measures 22 milligram per cubic meter at stack condition. So this is not the SCM, so you need to make conversion. And it is said that the stack gas is at one atmosphere at 200 degrees Celsius. So remember just now, uh, under the SCM, what is the temperature that they use? It was 25. But here, it is more real, I would say the temperature of the flue gas uh, wait wait i cannot say flue gas uh, emission gas i would say emission the temperature of the emission 200 degrees celsius twice as much as the boiling point of water so it did make sense lah. more more acceptable more logic yeah? and it contains 12 percent of moisture so don't don't be surprised lah. even at this high temperature it still have 12 percent of moisture because why when combustion happens lah. Water is part of the byproduct, so that's why it is emitted out. So this is a byproduct of the combustion, but in no way they are pollutants. But you have to exclude it. Yeah, that is the trouble. You have to exclude this to absorb moisture. And this combustion produced inside this emission air, they only have four percent oxygen. Of course, lah, because they already burn, guys. So of course, lah, they will have lower oxygen. And then they want you to calculate so that you need to compare with the standard. So here it goes. Now, first of all, moisture is not part of the contaminants or pollutants, so you need to exclude it. So first thing first, exclude the moisture. And also you need to correct it under standard condition, STP, standard temperature and pressure. So now according to the standard, one cubic meter, you will need to correct it according to this condition. But I think uh, it's probably a bit premature, but I hope you still remember like, the ideal gas law. Uh, I think I will need to skip to this formula first. Okay, Let me skip to this formula before I continue and calculate. Now, I think you must have seen this before from last week. So when you rearrange, it becomes PV over T equals to a constant. Now, why this is a constant? Because this part, the left-hand side of this equation, pressure, volume, and also temperature, will be uh, different, subjected to uh, the conditions of others. But none will going to change on the right-hand side. Now, N, as you remember, is the number of mole of gas. Now, theoretically, when the condition change, the, uh, the amount, okay, the, the amount of mole Okay, the number of mole of gases that you are calculating here will not change unless you 
you you you break the I mean the entire uh, system. So in all calculation for uh it, that we're going to do today, we're going to assume that this is applicable, and because we assume that this calculation all happened in a closed system, that means there's no escape of any emission gas outside of this system, or there's no ex uh, importing of these uh, foreign gas into the system. So by right, this N should not change. And of course, lah, R is the gas constant. So N multiplied with R, they are constant for the gas. And because of that, this equation occur. P1 V1 over T1 equals to P2 V2 over T2. So the, it represents different conditions and uh, this formula apply. Now let's say if you look carefully, the, uh, the, I mean, the volume of gas is proportional to the pressure, but inversely proportional to temperature. So you have to remember like, this, this, uh, this equation or this relationship. Before we go to this, uh, yeah, this calculation, <clears throat> because under one STP, it is assumed one cubic meter. I mean, according to the standard, lah. Yeah, the standard just now. Just to remember, right here. See, uh, this one one DSCF assume one cubic meter. So, coming here. So this is one cubic meter, and you will need to remove twelve percent of moisture. So this is why one minus zero point one two. Zero point one two is from twelve percent. So if twelve percent is the moisture, the remaining must be the the particulate matter, lah which is this way. Now, moving on further, 273 plus 20 over 273 plus 200. So, 273 is the, uh, what what they say, the, uh, the temperature, the temperature in Kelvin unit. So, this is the conversion la, of temperature to Kelvin unit. And multiply with this factor, you get 0 0.545 DSCF. So this is the volume of emission gas under DSCF. Okay, once you get this volume corrected, then only you correct its uh, so-called oxygen, yeah, the oxygen level, in which once converted, this is the uh, concentration. This is a concentration with DSCM. It's 40.36. But once you convert it, lah, once you correct it according to its correct oxygen level, it becomes 33.2. So you see the difference, quite a large difference, you see, if it is corrected. So back to the question again, did this emission comply with the standard as provided by the authority or the regulation? I think very obviously no, God, because here once you calculate 33.2, but here the standard 30. So, so you see, more, slightly more. But you see, the regulators, they don't, they don't see it this way. If it is higher than standard, that's it. You're going to receive a notice, a summon, a compound, we call it, okay? A penalty that you either challenge in court or you pay the fines. So, if this happened, lah, the the offender, the polluters, better have a, a deep pocket, lah, to do this. Perhaps you don't need to go to the jail, but it's going to hurt a lot, lah, of your wallet. Yeah. Okay. So next one, I'm going to show you this. Perhaps it's a little bit premature, but for calculation, I think we need to see this first, lah. Okay. What is shown here is the diagram of a pitot tube. So pitot tube is a device uh, made by stainless steel most of the time. It is very long. It looks like a probe, but it is not. It's actually a device for collecting emission sample. It is a very long uh, stainless steel pipe with two ways. Yeah, there are two ways as you can see right here. And each of the uh, channel will have a small inlet facing outside, not inside, facing outside. Uh, because it is assumed that when the emission air travels, it will going to enter this, uh, this, this, uh, this part, this opening of this pitot tube and travels into the end. And this end is channeled into 
an analyzer for us to measure the pressure. So you can see there are like pressure one and pressure two. Uh, that is because the if if the uh, if this pitot tube is entered at isokinetic uh, condition, it is said that the upper pressure and bottom pressure will show we exhibit difference, a slight difference. So this slight difference will be used to calculate the velocity, the velocity of emission emitted in the stack. So it has to be measured by a machine lah, because the small pressure that you have here, maybe it's very small. And, but that is how, that is how they, they measure the velocity. So that is the formula that you can see right here. V represent velocity. Uh, delta P is the I mean the difference pressure. So this has to be an absolute value. So that means this delta P, whether it's negative or positive, it still have to be a positive value. Divide by rho. Rho is the density of the flue gas. So this density is a unit kilogram per cubic meter uh, square root. So that is a formula. Okay, now in a uh, why gas flow is so important and it has to be measured here. Now, I hope you still remember last week when we learned about the flow rate. Okay, when flow rate is known, then only you can calculate accurately the volume of gas that you have collected and also that you need to convert. In this case, you need to convert uh, into its correct volume so that you can accurately calculate the concentration of pollutants inside the emission gas and of course compare to the STP, yeah, to the standard as, as, as defined under STP. So there are a lot of uh, calculation under this uh, chapter that you need to that you need to convert into STP lah, because obviously the emission they are not under STP. Okay, so the gas volume is temperature and pressure dependent, like what we learned under the ideal gas law. Okay, uh, therefore, in expressing the emission concentration, one need to apply ideal gas law to correct uh, the gas volume and temperature and also pressure. Uh, so, like we have like seen the earlier uh, earlier question, the stack temperature the temperature inside the chimney after combustion will not definitely under 25 degrees Celsius. It will be normally higher. If not 200, 250, it could be much higher depending on what industry that you are into. Yeah. So once again, the standard temperature as we need to know for many of the standards that we're going to compare is under 25 degrees Celsius. Or better still, if you want to use ideal gas law for any calculation, remember the unit have to be Kelvin and that would be 298 Kelvin. So this one, I won't going to go deep into it because last week we learned and I'm sure you have seen this before. It's just a reminder, yeah, the unit, please be reminded. The unit, very careful with it because when we talk about unit, the ideal gas law have several forms. And you better use the the I mean the, the correct formula based on the unit that you're going to use in your own calculation. Okay, so this one I've shown you, so I'm going to skip really quick. Uh just want to show you la, yeah, uh, pressure. Pressure is uh, inversely proportional to temperature, but proportional to uh, volume. Okay, now the application of gas law. Uh, so there is another question uh, for us to answer and to, to test uh, how do we convert the condition of emission air, uh, emission air sample collected, and you want to convert it back into STP using ideal gas law. So in this question, there's a stream of dry gas being withdrawn from the stack. So good news is they already say it's dry, no moisture. So no need to correct moisture. Lah. Okay, next one. The stack gases are at 200 degrees Celsius and a slightly lower pressure at 200, oh, sorry, 730 millimeter mercury. Because why? 
in uh, STP, it should be 760, right? So this is slightly lower. Uh, the stream flows through a heated filter, a set of cool impinges, and a small air pump, and then through a flow meter. The rate of flow is determined to be 30 liters per minute. So this is the measured one. Uh, at 20 degrees Celsius and 790 millimeter mercury. So the question asks you to calculate what is the actual volumetric flow rate through the filter. And then the next question, if there is such solid particles, 1.2 milligram particles are collected, they want you to calculate the concentration of particles in stack gas under this unit. So that is the... Uh, that is the concentration of particles in stack gas under STP. So, this is the answer. Now, I think probably you might be confused now on how this question is coming about, but if you confuse, my suggestion is that you will need to use the, uh, the STP, uh, no, not STP, the ideal gas law, the equation, right here. So, you're going to need to use this. This formula right here, you once you divide by uh divide by time, okay. Once you divide by time, v over time is the flow rate. So you have flow rate over here, and then you have p one over t one, and then only you can calculate to this, okay. So this is a flow rate. You can assume that this is v one over t one. So what you need to, uh, so no, this is V2, sorry. This is V2 over T2. This is V1 over T1, the one that you collected. So you assume that way. And then you will need to move lah, and then rearrange this uh, equation according to what I'm showing you just now, the ideal gas law equation. Then it makes sense lah, and you, your answer will be 52.4 liters per minute. Okay. Now, for any students who still yet to know how this works, I want you to uh, do a little bit of uh, sketching, mathematical sketching. I mean, derive, okay? derive a new equation. Derive a new equation, uh, as I said just now, V1 over T1, and that becomes the flow rate. Then you rearrange. Once you have done and you want to check with me, you can always snap a picture okay, of your own workings, mathematical rearrangement. Uh, then you post it in you future I discuss group, and then I'll verify that. But I can tell you straight la, this calculation, this answer A here is correct. This is how it works, and this is the flow rate. So once this flow rate has been determined, then you can take this and uh, Use this to calculate la, the total volume of sample gas, as you can see right here. Okay. So this flow rate multiply with the, uh, the duration, the time. So you multiply 30 minutes, la, but let's not forget, this is in liter. And one liter is equivalent, uh, sorry, 1,000 liter equivalent to one cubic liter. So this is a unit conversion. La. You slash the L unit on top, slash the L unit below. So 52.4 divided by 1,000, multiply with 30 minutes. There you go. You have 1.572 cubic meter. Now, I remember this is not the answer just yet, right? So student, uh, after this, if you in quiz or in, uh, in anything, like if you want to calculate anything, right, if this is not your final answer, please don't round up first. Don't round up. So I know this is like have many significant figures than it should be, but so be it because this is not the, uh, the final answer. You can have as many significant figures as you want. You can you can copy la, from your calculator. There are many more digits behind. Kind of, so, so be it. This is not the final answer. Because later on, you're going to use this volume, this volume of gas sample, and you will need to convert here and calculate the C part. Okay which is the concentration in its correct unit. So what was the mass? So this is the mass, the mass of suspended solid, 1.42 milligram, divide by 
the uh, volume of gas sample 1.572 cubic meter and the answer wants it to be in micrograms so once again 1000 microgram equivalent to one milligram so this one we put here to convert lah, milligram to microgram so you slash milligram on top slash milligram or below and you ended up have to multiply 1000 lah because of here and there you go your answer okay the answer uh, for the concentration of suspended solid suspended solid what was the key word huh? sorry uh yeah solid particle yeah the the concentration of solid particles 900 zero uh, to 903 microgram per cubic meter so you see some of the standard requires you to compare in milligram per cubic meter but in this question they want it in microgram per cubic meter be careful yeah every time you answer the quiz question or yeah we don't have final exam time so you have you can relax up in quiz question if we ask you this one remember look carefully on the question what the question wants and then you give them what they want yeah the unit very careful and then there's this last equation. I promise you this is the last one. What if the uh, the gas flow or the flow rate, the flow rate is subjected to different molecular weight. Uh, if that is so, then the equation might be a little bit different in which you're going to have a square root. Well, frankly speaking, like I told you just now, it is a closed system they're talking about. So the molecular weight may be the same before and after so most likely this one is the same uh, it is a it is a variable that you can cancel out later because one on top one below right okay. so to calculate the uh, gas flow rate okay, to calculate the gas flow rate uh, in the actual and also calibrated condition you use this formula and is also subjected to uh, uh, the the factors two two factors under the ideal gas law which is temperature and also pressure yeah why can't you see volume here because yeah flow rate I mean flow rate is already inside this Q V over T that is flow rate yeah so the question here having you uh, you have an oil phase matter that was calibrated for air at seven uh, seventy degree Fahrenheit and what at and what atmosphere you're using it to measure air flow and you get an indicated a reading of 25 ACFF uh, at 100 degree uh, Fahrenheit and 1.1 atmosphere. What is the true gas flow rate in SCFM? So here is a calculation. Substituting the equation to the correct indicated flow rate to an actual flow rate and then convert the actual flow rate using ideal gas law to the equivalent standard flow rate. So the equation, 25 is what you have measured. So you, uh, you substitute like, all the equation, uh, all the values inside here. Like I said, R is the constant, mostly derived from the molecular weight, square rooted, and you have 24.5 CFM. And then one more time, uh, in order to calculate is SCFM, uh, the standard cubic feet meter. Standard cubic feet meter. You will need to... Uh, uh, correct it la, under the uh, standard condition. 1.1 is what you measured. 1.0 is the standard uh, atmosphere. So you multiply, then you get 25.8. Uh, frankly speaking, la, this one, I don't think you're going to use this as, as frequent as you can. But remember, yeah, student, if you have a chance later, I recommend you to watch a video. La. Now, that video link I'll provide to you. Inside there, they have two more equations. And that is... Uh, I think the comprehensive formula in order to calculate flow rates and also correct volume. So there are many forms, uh, I tell you, student. What you see here is under this lecture, but you may find other forms of uh, to calculate flow rate. But more or less, they are going to use uh, the substitutes, okay? They're going to substitute ideal gas law formula uh, to come up with this equation. So you can watch that video later. There are no examples given uh, on the later video or on that video. Uh, but I'm going to give you exercise. So don't worry. You can try a few later on. I think. Uh, okay. Now, the next thing is uh, we're going to learn 
uh, a little bit about how this uh, monitoring of emission is conducted. So here we have like uh, two types, two types of CEMS, Continuous Emission Monitoring System. There are two types. So as I've uh, mentioned in the introduction earlier, there are in-situ CEMs, and the one that is not shown earlier is the extracted CEM. Now, frankly speaking, only extracted CEMs have the equipment and also the so-called sampling element. So you will see at the end. Lah. So we're going to start with in-situ CEMs, which uses a lot of uh, sophisticated equipments, uh, but I mean, nonetheless important. Lah. In fact, quite important also to give us uh, actual real-time information regarding the quality of the emission air. Yeah? So in situ is, can be said lah, even more important because they give us the the uh, the level of pollutants at real time, which is what we actually needed. Lah. Given that the air uh, travels and moves very fast, so immediate action is needed, but only if you have immediate information coming from in situ CMS. So in situ system have at least one part of the analysis subsystem mounted in the stack in direct contact with the flue gas. Now, this one, since they already say in situ, that means at the stack, of course, at the site. Now, the site that they're talking about here is immediately in the stack. So you can imagine like, the chimney very high up. Yeah, you're not wrong thinking of that. There are like some sensors, processors, and samplers all uh, installed, all installed very high. There are some uh, installed at a very low level, depending, uh, depending on where the... Uh, where the monitoring needs to be conducted yeah some even measures the entire stack the entire uh uh what length okay across the stack so i mean that is another type lah, of uh, cems later on okay the lack of conditioning and transport subsystem indicate that in situ cems design requires substantially less equipment than do extractive cems design now, because they have like less equipment, uh, they don't they don't channel this system. They only measure on 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 site. So, logically, you might think that you just need a sensor. You pass a sensor, they compute, and then you wire it down. Then you get the signal and whatnot. Yeah, you can you can say that more or less is like that. Uh, but of course, lah, they have uh, even more sophisticated uh, uh, assembly of this so called equipment. Okay, so. There is a pros and cons. Lah. While they can give you immediate result and they have like uh, uh, less components, at least they should be uh, less components so that they can easily mount on site high up in the stack. Uh, but because of the lack of conditioning, they may be subjected to a lot more harsh environment. So as you know, the flue gas that comes up, not only they are uh, high in temperature, that may damage the sensor or the CEMS, in situ CMS, they're also subjected to the uh, to the pollutants itself. So if you still remember, they have SOX, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide. They also have NOx, sulfur dioxide and sulfur monoxide. Now, these gas, they are acidic. They are very corrosive. And most of the CEMS, in order to be durable and whatnot, they will have to withstand like, this, harsh this harsh condition. Because whatever that comes in contact with this gas, uh, they will going to melt it. Not melt it, uh, they will going to uh, corrode it. So due to this factor, the CMS has to be corrosive resistant, corrosion resistant. Yeah. And this is not really uh, uh, news to us, uh, given that the flue gas, they have so much of this uh, corrosive gas. Okay, so inside the uh, CEMS, uh, these are the two uh, two types uh, two types of in situ CMMS that you can find. One is the path analyzer, the other one is point analyzer. Now, I won't go to talk too much about this one because I think I've mentioned it already. These CEMS can be used to measure the emission quality across the chimney or across the stack. 
So you can measure from the bottom up until the tip of the chimney. So this is path analyzer. There is another type called point analyzer in which they only measure a certain level. Like for example, directly at the bottom. Yeah, because the bottom should have like the highest concentration. Card. So you can do that. Or you can measure the one, another one, which is on top of the chimney, on top of the stack, at the tip, uh, uh, at the top. Lah. Now, because that is the one that will be released and perhaps uh, better uh, better use lah, to, to measure the, uh, the actual condition at the point of release. Yeah. But I think you still have to make a lot of conversion lah, because even at the top, lah, the temperature is much lower, but still not STP. Lah, yeah. So it's up to you where you want to analyze it. Yeah. So they have like a different conditions or requirements in order to be calculated uh, to be considered as path analyzer or point analyzer, but you know the point, lah, yeah. Okay, continuous emission monitoring. So in this system, they have these components lah, from A to B. Uh, but like I said, like, I don't think I want to go too deep into this detail except for the important part. So I'll skip this one. You can read later. It's not that it is not, not important, but less important, I would say. So go and read yourself. For yeah, type interest, I have exactly one hour. I need to go very fast. Okay. In situ CMS requirement. Now, yeah, for installation of this so-called uh, continuous emission monitoring system, it will be subjected to regulation or what they call standard uh, in order to have like a accurate measurement so that it can be used for comparison. So these are the guidelines that is provided by uh, US EPA. I'm not sure whether this one is applied by Malaysians with a DOE, but most likely it is. Uh, yeah. So the type of uh, emission that will be the type of gas la, that will be measured inside the emission are, as you can see right there, they are more or less the same as the uh, ambient air, the components that will need to be measured in ambient air, except for a few difference. La. Surprisingly, here you also measure oxygen. Because what I told you guys, if you have more oxygen inside the stack, that means uh, it may alter the composition of other uh, uh, pollutants inside the emission so it needs to be known also uh, the other one is total particulate this one maybe can you can measure the particulate uh, emitted by the uh, by the chimney uh, this one is very similar to the one that we learned last week the uh, pm particulate matter total suspended particular or whatnot now opacity is the one that looks at how opaque is the emission so there will be a lot of optics involved and why do we measure this one because the opacity of a an emission is closely related to the particulate that will be emitted yeah so this one not only you know the uh, the, the so-called uh, estimate the particulates inside the emission you also can can gauge la, uh, in terms of uh, how thick you can say how thick the emission the asap yeah that, that you emit because i mean logically if the opacity is very high very opaque very thick once it's emitted you can expect lah you can expect complaint for someone coming so the opacity have to be very low lah, as low as possible okay So nitrogen dioxides or nitrogen oxides inside the CMS, how do we measure it? If we want to measure in situ NOx gas, uh, the assembly is uh, what we have learned just now. In general, they have a, a part where they sample the emission gas and then it will be channeled to the detector. Once detected, then it will be converted into electronic signal and then printed out or, or channeled uh, into, into a spreadsheet where you can see the result later on. Now, those equipments or those, uh, those, uh, those, compo uh, those components will be subjected to a specification. Uh, so in this case, it is a US EPA specification 40 CFR part 60. So these are the standards that they need to follow. 
the specification, I would say, specification of the in situ CEMS that they need to follow. How exactly? I think there are many more that you read or you can read it yourself. I'm going to show you the, the general operation. Now, yeah. So they have a analyzer to acquire data so they get channeled down to you. Um, it have a daily zero and span checks fault lamps on the analyzer panel or codes on the data acquisition system and uh, the data acquisition system operation. So you might think that this one uh, in situ CEMS looks small, but I can say it is not small. The size can be as big as a large cabinet. So inside the cabinet, it houses all of these things. And then there are many buttons that you need to press. Uh, perhaps later on, we're going to have a few pictures I can show you how it looks like this so-called in-situ CEMS. And, you know, there's, only, there's not just only one. Eh? There can be a series of these in-situ CEMS depending on uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, pollutants that you're analyzing. So it, it can be, you know, this CEMS in actual condition, it can house just one big room with many of this CEMS unit, in situ CMS unit. Yeah. So if you still remember last time, uh, last week, we learned about ambient air quantification of NOx gas, in which this is what I, uh, I showed you, nitrogen monoxide or nitric oxide, NO, NO right here, reacts with one ozone to produce nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen gas. Now this is HV, uh, well, there's a little Latin name that I don't know, but let's call it HV. Now this is the electromagnetic wave or light, we call it. In this case, it's definitely light. Electromagnetic wave can be so many. Uh, visible light is one of them. But in this case, the reaction between nitric oxide and ozone produce a visible light that can be quantified. So, the quantification of nitric oxide can be easily conducted with a supply of ozone and then, of course, a detector, a detector that can measure it. That is why we call this entire reaction chemiluminescence. That means chemical reaction happens and it gives you the illumination, light. So based on the intensity of this light picked up by the detector, we can know like, how much of nitric oxide is there. But what about for nitrogen dioxide? Nitrogen dioxide can also be measured the same way, but with one condition. The nitrogen dioxide have to be first converted to nitric oxide, then the entire thing goes on. So based on the total amount of NO plus NO2, you have total NOx. So this is how they measure. And this reaction can be said immediate and spontaneous, which is why uh, Majority, I would say, majority of the in-situ CEMS that measures NOx gas uses this. Some, I mean, some there are others, but this is one, one, of, the, one of the popular ones. Okay, so what about SOX? Sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide. This one, there are many ways. But recently, I wouldn't say very recent, but it's, it's quite recent. The new technology uses a lot of light technology, including... NDIR, non-dispersive infrared. So this one, why it is so good? Like I said last week, when you have one of these, it can, it can be quite specific, number one. And number two, it can measure a lot of gas at the same time. So that is, a, that is why NDIR is uh, gaining a lot of popularity because of their uh, ability to measure a lot of pollutant gas at the same time. And also it's uh, sensitive, no, not sensitive, specific, specific nature of its analysis. That means it won't be interrupted or um, affected by the presence of many, many pollutant gas, which may be present in emission. Yeah. So spectroscopy, gas filter correlation, these are the other methods. These are the other methods that can be used to measure SOX. Okay. So I think this one, I will going to go too detailed on this one, except once again, I would say NDIR, spectroscopy, non-dispersive infrared. Like I said, advanced 
and very practical because they can also uh, measure, yeah? Not only is specific, it can also measure plenty of pollutant gas at the same time. Oh yeah, let me, let me reiterate uh, now, at the later part of this second point, the reference cell. So NDIR works in, in a way very similar to a two-way UVV spectrophotometer. Now for those who have learned what is that, it actually has two lines, yeah? One is to measure the background. Okay, uh, because any matrix, including air or maybe water, air like in this case, will have a little bit of absorption due to the presence of gases inside the air. Okay, they will have some absorption. Now, in order to cancel out all this so-called background, you will need to have like a line that measure the background gas versus the one in emission. So whatever the difference coming from the uh, these two lines will be calculated okay will be calculated in order to determine the types of emission and also the quantity of each of the components okay components of pollutants inside the emission which is why you have two cell okay so next is carbon monoxide also uses NDIR technology uh, of course, we know that carbon monoxide can be measured in other way using wet chemistry and can determine later. Uh, but you see, uh, carbon monoxide is uh, it's very common in any emission because why? Earlier, we mentioned that some of the combustion technology can be conducted even at very low oxygen. So if that is the case, you can expect a lot of carbon monoxide if it is not a complete combustion. Uh, so usually, la, most of the pollutants that comes from emission is due to that, the lack of oxygen, incomplete combustion, you have carbon monoxide. And now carbon monoxide, if you don't know, la, can kill us without you knowing it. It is odorless. That is why it is not really an option that we go to the other, like the extractive institute, because of the, the impact of carbon monoxide. It kills people instantly. So it's imperative la, why NDIR is preferred here, because they give fast result, the content of carbon monoxide in, immediately. Yeah. So, so once again, la, NDIR technique is used to measure in situ carbon monoxide. Um, I think this one I already mentioned, so I won't going to talk too much on this one. So I'm going to skip this one. And next is oxygen. So like I said to you earlier, oxygen is measured not because it is a pollutant, but it impacts the content of other pollutants which is why oxygen also needs to be measured. And I think this one is no, no secret la, that in order to measure oxygen, you need NDIR la, usually. Uh, but here, they explain la, why oxygen needs to be measured. And I think I've told you just now, uh, oxygen influence yeah, the content of NOx gas inside the chimney or the stack. Because here they say that the more oxygen you have, the higher the likeliness or you can find more nitrogen oxides. Because they will form, if, if, if you have more oxygen inside the chimney, there's more likeliness that the NOx gas are formed thermally. So as you can see right here, here are the explanation. Why oxygen is needed because they would influence la, the formation of higher content of NOx gas. Yeah. Okay, moving on. The next one, opacity. Just now I mentioned to you opacity indicates how much of the particulates inside the emission. Or in other words, you can say like it measures how thick is your emission. Now, when we talk about opacity, you are going to measure la, how cloudy, I would say, how cloudy, how opaque, how cloudy is your emission. 
So in this case, obviously light is involved here. So whatever that is measured here, you are going to be subjected to a law called Beer Lambert's law. It's the same law that we use to measure concentration of other things as well as the uh, what they say the the intensity la, of light that we, we want to determine la, the opacity. So here if the uh, if the gas uh, if the emission has a lot of particulates the opacity will be very high. So in this case guys they're going to measure the transmittance. Transmittance means how much of light can be detected from the source. So if the intensity of light from the detector is exactly the same as the intensity of the light source, that means you have 100% transmittance, so opacity is zero, non-opaque. That means clear, very clear. But of course, like in emission, you expected to see a lot of uh, dust, the smoke very thick so logically if you see a smoke light cannot travel through so they will be blocked by the presence of this particulate and as a result the intensity like usually picked up by the sensor will be much lower so because of that you can calculate the opacity yeah so um by the way, the light travels in a straight line directly from the source to the detector. So let's say if they collide with the, uh, the particulars inside the emission air, they will be deflected. So in this case, they are scattered, like say, the light will be scattered into different directions. So that's why the intensity is lower. Okay, so I think uh, this one I already mentioned clearly. Now, what about particulate matter? So don't be confused. Huh? Opacity is different. Particulate matter is a different thing. Although they are connected, but they are a different thing to measure. And the way they measure also is quite different. Because in terms of opacity, I think light is shine. You picked up the light intensity, that's it. So what can you say about this one is that it doesn't give you a, an absolute uh, measurement of how much of particulate is inside there, inside the emission air. But here, you can. Now, there are different approaches. There are several approaches where the particulate matter can be measured in situ. Uh, it could be light scattering instrument, better gauge instrument, scintillation monitors, oscillating microbalance instrument. There are four, four types. Some is more preferred, some are not. But I think from my explanation later, you will know like, which one is better. So I, I start with light scattering uh, method. So this instrument will going to work, you can say, right, very close to the, uh, the, 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 the opacity that we determined earlier, where you have a light source and you have a detector in which the gas, the emission gas, will going to travel through this beam. Now, what will going to happen that instead of measure the intensity, uh, like uh, unlike transmit uh, unlike transmission unlike transmission this light scattering uh, instrument will going to measure the reflectance okay they're going to see how the light scatters because in this case God, now let's say if you have a light a torch light if you have a torch light and you shine into a moving object you remember how the shadow will going to react it will going to move accordingly, isn't it? And based on the size of this shadow, you can actually estimate how big is that particle. Okay, so the more shadow that moves over, the more particle you can count. So in this light scattering instrument, they have a light source and they have a detector and this detector is not located at one point at the end of the light source, but rather in a semi-circular form. This detector will going to see the shadow moving across. So the detector is a semi-circular. Um, and of course, it, 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 it measures almost like the transmission instrument earlier. But 
it measures the shadow. So based on this shadow moving, the computer will compute into number of particulates as well as the sizes. So how good is that? Not only you, you can determine the particulate matter, you can also know the size. Yeah. So you already know, Lagan, this one is more preferred, but whether or not it is used, that one depends on the cost. So it's not cheap. Yeah. As, as, as far as I know, like, this instrument is not coming cheap. It's quite expensive, but very, very good. Yeah. So this is what you look at. Lah. There are a sample chamber. So this is a detector. You have a light source. They shine on it and they pick up the signal. Um, I think I don't need to. But they also have two channels. Uh, one that measures the background and also the sample gas. Uh, nothing much to show. Um, so next one is scintillation particulate. So this one operates very similar to the manners of a uh, transmission meters, transmissometer. So this scintillation monitor generates a light beam that is projected across the stack or duct being monitored. Uh, like light scattering instrument, the scintillation instrument is moderately sensitive to particulate size distribution. So this one, um, it works almost like uh, the other two versions, except that this one, where they, they, they say they have a weakness in which they cannot distinguish between solid particles and water droplets. So I think the name or uh, the description already tell you last scintillation, not the best, uh, but it's one, nonetheless one of the methods lah, being used. Yeah. So as you can see right there, the receiver or the detector, almost like transmissometer, but they measure lah, the scattering of the light. Yeah. Okay. Um, So that is the explanation from earlier. I'm going to skip. Okay, next up is beta gauge instrument. So this one works a little bit different than the earlier ones. While the earlier three versions uses a lot of optics and also light, this one does not. It uses radiation in which whatever the particulate collected at one chamber or one part will be given, will be given a certain dose of beta radiation and from this absorbed radiation, they will quantify how much of particulate matter. So what do you think? Beta radiation. Now in Malaysia, whatever radiation that you want to work, you will, you will go to see one more agency. That is nuclear Malaysia. Because they are the one who regulate the usage of whatever that involves nuclear radiation or whatnot. So I think the name, I mean, I mean, this one already tells you lah, yeah, whether this is favorable or not. Now, if there is unavoidable consequences, or yeah, maybe you will need to use this. But if I am the owner of the factory, I will try my best to have less incidents or, or, or meetings with regulators lah. Yeah, it's enough to deal with DOE. So you want to deal with nuclear Malaysia. Why? Because additional cost. Like every time you deal with this agency, you can prepare money for certification, to employ them, uh, to, to, to get them over to your plant, to, to test, to, to standardize, everything. Regulation, it involves a lot, a lot of money. So beta gauge, it is used, but I think logically, in order to save cost, this may not be the, the, the one that people prefer. Yeah. So here is what you can see. Now, this is the, the part from the chimney. There is like a, a moving belt. Yeah. So this also called a filter band. We're going to filter whatever the particulates that comes through. And that it will be channeled through a second chamber that they given a certain dose of beta radiation. And then after that, it will be detected later. Okay. So very straightforward, but it uses beta radiation. That's the only issue. Yeah. So, so done with the in-situ measurement, now we are moving on to the second type, second type of CEMS. Still have half an hour to go. Okay. Now, the second type of uh, CEMS is the extractive one, extracted CEMS. Now, this one, technically, there is a component where you need to sample the flue gas or the emission from the chimney or the stack. And it will be transported uh, elsewhere, outside of the chimney, maybe not too far away, but obviously outside of the, of the stack. 
and it will be a condition separated and treated in several ways so that they can be uh, detected uh, and quantified in a certain way. Now, most of these extracted CMS are there present so that they can complement with the in situ CMS because not all the pollutants can be measured by in situ way. So that is why they are here. They collect the flue gas, they get they they they, they treat them differently. And obviously, there's one component la, that in situ CMS cannot do, which is the heavy metal content. We all know that the uh, combustion component, especially the particulate, they contain a lot of heavy metals. Now, this is not uh, in situ CMS can quantify or detect because they are in the particulates. And so far, there's no technology they can do that in situ. So they have to be extracted. That means the particulate that you collected will need to be treated, will need to be prepared, and then analyzed uh, separately to determine the heavy metals. Yeah. And then one of the heavy metals that, uh, that needs to be determined is mercury. Because why? Because coal can be said as the major source of mercury inside the air. It's not that they are mercury contaminating the uh, the coal, but it occurs naturally in most of the fossil fuel. Coal is the highest, yeah. So that is why US EPA mandates lah, yeah, uh, extracted CEMS to monitor mercury, for example, and also other heavy metals lah, or maybe some other um or get uh, some other inorganic components inside the uh, the 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 emission air so mostly done by in situ continuous emission monitoring technique uh, so yeah once again i already mentioned this one according to the standard as uh, defined by us EPA. later on you're going to see a series lot of the of the methods later on so how does this air being uh being sampled first of all now before we continue the stack the chimney is not always the same there's no regulation that mandates you to build a stack in one way or the other as long as they are high enough they will do so some of this stack or maybe the ducts like the the piping the piping that connects the stack and whatnot they are not that strict. Some of them come in circular form, round piping, some of them in rectangular duct. So you know the you you, you know the shape. Now, the shape is not really important, but uh, because of that, they are not exactly the same. So these are the examples of methods. There are many methods ranging from um, how you sample, how you determine the velocity. Uh, uh, how do you use the pitot tube? There are many types of pitot tube. Uh, so are these are uh, the regulation uh, from the uh, from uh, beginning from the design up to the sampling technique and moving on to the quantification or the measurement. So there are many uh, many standards or many methods. Yeah, subjected here. But in order to measure the particulate matter, there are two methods. Lah. There are two main procedures in order to measure particulate matter pm uh, so they are method number five and number num uh, method number 17 they are different slightly now if after this i'm going to show you the diagram between method five and 17 they differ slightly there are pros and cons once again so depends lah which one on uh, that they're using but no matter what method are you going to use? Sampling is always important in a way that whenever you perform any sampling, any sampling of emission uh, of, of gases coming from the stack, it has to be conducted in isokinetic condition. So what does isokinetic mean? Oh, wait. Um, wait a minute. I think there's no description, but later on, okay. So I think we, uh, I will explain to you what is isokinetic means. But in the meantime, this is how it looks like. Method number five. It has a pitot tube 
So this is a pitot tube inserted inside the wall, through the wall into the, uh, uh, the, the stack. So this is where all the flue gas or the emission coming up. So they're going to collect the temperature and also the pressure. And of course, the, uh, the emission air will going to travel through this tube into a box. So this box contains a heater that they can maintain the temperature and they also have a filter to filter out the particulates if you want to determine the particulates and also a thermometer to determine the temperature so this box has to be heated uh, all the time temperature has to be con uh, constant and then whatever the flue gas that travels past this filter we're going to contain the the the, the other contaminants like NOx, SOx uh, carbon monoxide, oxygen, and whatnot. So they're going to travel through this a series of impinges. So each of the impinges containing different type of chemicals so that they can trap different kind of pollutants. And of course, these gases are very hot. That's why you must have an ice bath to cool them down. Uh, otherwise, it might going to destroy the chemicals inside here. Yeah. So they come from one series to another. So if they come through this, the chemical will trap with just one gas. The others, they will continue. And then the other type of gas will be trapped and they continue until one point that uh, there are no more gas pollutants that you need to trap. And they, tra and they travel through this check valve into this line and into this pump. So it's very important that you ensure that all this pollutant gas, especially the NOx and the SOx, are removed before it comes to this tight pump uh, because otherwise, uh, Basically, like the side pump is corrosive, right? all those gases. So they come into this valve and they measure the, the flow rate, the pressure, the manometer. So what's uh, uh, exceeding this gas exit are supposed to be very clean. Like all of them, they're, they're being removed. So what is the difference between method 5 and method uh, 17? It's actually right here. Only in method 5, you have this heated box, this heater box right here, just before the impinger. Yeah, so method 5 have this heater box, whereas method 17, not so ever. So you can see it's missing. They don't have this heater box, uh, but rather they sample directly from, uh, they, they sample directly from the emission air, in which they still have a filter. But this filter is exactly inside the stack. So this thermo, uh, this this, ther this thermometer sensor, this thermometer sensor measures the actual temperature of emission inside the stack. Okay. So the filter is also inside here. They remove all the particulates, and then they travels through this probe, and the same thing goes. The same thing goes after that. So you can see the difference. Method five and seventy. You can say method 17 la measures more accurately because everything is already inside the stack. Uh, whether or not it's practical, um, it's, up to, it's up to people la, because this one filter is inside the stack. So you have to remove the probe in order to determine the filter. Right? So there are pros and cons also, la, yeah? method 5 versus method uh, 17. So method five have a, it's a series of impinges and equipment. So let's call it a sampling train. Uh, and there is a requirement where the filter, the filter where they need to uh, use to uh, separate the particulate have to be kept at this temperature, 25 degree Fahrenheit. Not really that hot actually, because Fahrenheit, I think maybe there's a, there's a mistake. Maybe not, oh yeah, yeah, Fahrenheit, because 248, so it's heated lah. Okay, so I think uh, everything I've already mentioned, so I'm going to skip. I won't go to repeat this thing. Let's see if there's any important things I need to say to you. Uh, no. So let's just continue. Right? Still at particulate, yeah. Um, we told you, so I think I, may, I, I already, uh, yeah. I mentioned everything, how method 5 and method 17 works. So I'm going to go to this one now. Earlier, I promised you to explain now what does isokinetic means and why they are so important. Okay. Now, the sample gas flow 
uh, the flow rate through the particulate matter sampling tray must be adjusted as the probe is moving from point to point during traversing of the sampling location. So, so it is said that this so-called sampling tray uh, is not mounted uh, permanently, is not mounted permanently to the stack, but rather it is only used when there is a need. So there must be an operator going to one point to one point, sticking this probe into it and doing the sampling. So that's why they say traversing of sampling location. You only move to sampling point to sampling point based on the requirement. Yeah? It's not fixed. Uh, now, there is a thing about particulate matter is that they have weight. Particulate matter, of course, they are mass. They have weight. So because of that, it exerts a little bit of inertial properties. And they say that these inertial properties might influence la, the velocity of gas coming into the probe. Now, there might be a, a two possibilities. Either the velocity is too high or too low. But either way, it might go to impact the accuracy of your flow rate measurement. And you don't want that because any slight differences might go into... Uh, make your calculation of the concentration of particulate <coughs> inaccurate. So that is why the velocity of the gas entering the sample nozzle have to be the same with the velocity of the gas stream. So how fast the emission moving from the bottom to the top of the stack must be the same with the velocity entering the nozzle because only with the same flow rate, then only you can accurately quantify the volume of the gas and then only you will get a accurate concentration of particulate matter and this condition is what they call isokinetic so the sampling has to be occurred la. under isokinetic condition as much as you can yeah so here is the description la, if you have our over isokinetic sampling what happened you have under isokinetic sampling, what will going to happen? So here, whatever la, the, 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 the variation, non-compliance of isokinetic condition, why going to influence the accuracy of your uh, concentration of the uh, pollutants as measured? Now, this diagram shows you la, if you have uh, over isokinetic, that means the, uh, the velocity is higher. Um, so you're probably going to get more uh, particulars into the nozzle. So you're going to have overestimation, overestimation of the, oh, sorry, if you have more gas traveling into it, which is over here, um, you're going to get more gas and less particulate. So there will be underestimation, okay? Underestimation of the uh, PM concentration. Whereas if it is under, that means you have less gas volume but the same amount of particulates. So obviously, the PM level will be higher than expected. So that is a false, say, false positive result, I would say. Either way, they are not going to be giving you the accurate results. So these are the so-called bias that you may get if non-isokinetic conditions were used to sample the air. So um, this one, uh, the particulate matter PM10 emission can be measured more or less the same way as you can see right here. And, and they look very similar to method 17. Yeah, except that at the nozzle, you have a PM10 sampler in which, yep, the, uh, the filter. Yeah. So what differentiate between PM and also PM10 is a filter. Maybe they use a smaller uh, aperture, smaller pore size PM uh, filter to be installed here. And the same thing goes. It's the same uh, sampling train, I will call it. Yeah. So it's what you can see, like the, assemb the assembly or the uh, components, uh, the components that are part of the sampling train to measure particulate matter. Um, I don't think you should uh, memorize all this name, but get to know like, yeah, how does it, how does it looks like. It, it's exactly the same like, as the diagram that we have mentioned earlier. Um, now, this one, um, 
it may have a cyclone to remove larger particulate. Now, why this is why why this is important is because PM10 is small. Now, if you want to measure things that small, of course, the larger particle need to be removed first. Now, the larger that PM10 can be removed using a tool, an instrument called a cyclone. Cyclone is like a a cone shape uh, a cone shaped structure where the emission will be uh, a, a channel into the cyclone. Now, the movement of airflow will be in circular form downwards. So they move circular form downwards, and because of this movement, uh, plus with the uh, suitable flow rate, the heavier, larger and heavier particulate will go to sink. So once they sink at the bottom, at the small tip, they will trap. And then what else? The air have to still move out, so they move outward slowly, bringing a smaller PM10 particles up, and then it reaches this nozzle. Okay, so this is how they separate heavier, larger particulate, larger than uh, 10 micrometer, and they allow this uh, measurement of PM10 to occur. So the assembly of the sampling train is more or less the same in method method 17. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the isokinetic range also is still subjected. Like it has to be a, a sample in isokinetic condition, in which the range will be as I mean can be as low as eighty, not less than that, or can be up to one hundred twenty. So it can be off slightly, but not too much, like, yeah, The isokinetic range. Uh, okay. So this one. Uh, it's part of the criteria because nowadays we also measure the smaller particles because these particles, uh, the impact, the impact towards human health also depends on the particulate size. Now, not just the particulate size that can tell, uh, they can tell you how harmful they are, but also how far they can travel. PM10 usually don't travel too far, but PM2.5, they can travel really, really far. Yeah. So that's why US EPA, they separated PM10 and PM2.5 out of uh, total particulate matter so that they can better, better uh, estimate lah, the impact of this, of this emission towards human health. Okay, like I said, 2.5 is smaller, obviously, than PM10. Uh, the impact also can be more severe. I think this one are the repetition of what I said earlier, so I don't repeat this. Uh, I think I already mentioned this one also, so I'll just skip. Okay, done with particulate matter. Now, the other gas, like socks, knocks, or whatnot. Now, let's not forget, yeah, just now, when we're talking about in-situ CEMS, there are already several real-time online measurements of socks and knocks. So you might ask me then why are you still measuring using extracted, uh, extracted CMS? Now the answer is quite simple. Remember just now the in situ CMS that you need to check from time to time, yeah. So you need to check that. Right? So how do you check? Ah, uh, this way lah, because this one, uh, provides you, in another approach, another approach of uh, measuring SOX and NOX gas inside emission. Yeah, because this one, they extract the air, exactly the same air inside the, the emission, and they determine, they quantify these uh, this, uh, pollutants separately outside of the in-situ CEMS. So this one is used for cross-check, to cross-check the accuracy of the pollutants. So the principle, I think you still remember last week in ambient air quality monitoring and sampling they are trapped using impingers using certain chemicals and then they are measured using a colorant a dye using uvv spectrometer but it is in this case they may be a little bit different so another chemicals is used so this this method is a titration method 
Uh, so this one uses manual titration, no more using UVVs, uh, but you have like a, a, a another, another reagent being used here, which is the barium taurine, barium taurine titration. So this, this region add in and you titrate different color measures. So from the amount of barium taurine needed to complete a titration, it will be quantified to uh, measure yeah, the content of sulfur dioxide. So this one is not UV visa titration. So this one is the uh, calculation in which I won't go to say too many things except that this type of uh, measurement also have limitation. They may have like a concentration limit. So beware. Yeah. Uh, other things I think I'll just skip lah. Yeah. Because these are factual things that you can read yourself. So I don't want to waste time given that I only have 10 minutes to go. So I need to get quick. So once again, lah, these gas have to be trapped, bubbled through trapping, and then they will be filtered lah, with a lot of things so that they want to filter out the pollutants other than sulfur dioxide. And then this is how it looks like. More or less the same with method five. And then they can take like, either one of these uh, impinges, eh? one of the impinges, pour out the chemicals, and then they titrate it. Uh, NOx gas, yeah, NOx gas is very similar also. Also trapped inside the impinger by a specific chemical. And, oh yeah, talking about NOx, um, they have a very unique equipment. And it can be uh, collected using a grab sampler. So a grab sampler is a very portable probe connected with a lot of like a glassware and they can actually uh, collect like gas samples just like uh, the extracted in situ uh, CEMS that we see but very portable. Stick it inside the chimney and they can start collecting gas in which the same way happens. They are trapped and then they will be color colorimetrically determined by sulfur uh, phenol disulfonic acid procedure. So as you can see, like the chemicals that we, we use include uh, sulfur acid, hydrogen peroxide in, in a certain amount. And then, uh, so yeah, they, they are not supposed to be exposed to extreme heat or sunlight lah, yeah, during this determination. So this is how it looks like. Lah. A small one probe. So this is handheld and it's connected to a glassware where the the, the the so-called NOx are, are, are trapped, connected to a manometer to measure the flow rate and also a pump. Yeah. So this is how it looks like, a grab sampler. And then finally, what about the metals? Like I say to you, the metals, they are all contained inside the particulate. So first thing first that we need to know is we need to trap the total particulate. And from there, only you can determine yeah, the so-called heavy metals. So in this case, uh, once again, you will need to uh, use a stack sampler uh, to, to collect this particulate. And it's quite safe to say that once you have determined the uh, particulate matter, you can actually use and recycle this particulate. Once you collect it and you have determined the weight, the same particulate matter can be digested. Digested means dissolved in acid. So this one, you have to use a strong acid, la, most likely nitric acid plus... Uh, sulfuric acid or maybe a little bit of hydrogen peroxide so to oxidize la. because why in this dust these dust are not necessarily ash 100 percent no because this ash may be organic may be inorganic if it's inorganic no problem you put acid they dissolve uh, but if they have hydrocarbon you see hydrocarbon is not surprising because anyway you're burning hydrocarbon based fossil fuel so these will not be easily digested by acid, but rather you put hydrogen peroxide. That's why hydrogen peroxide is here to digest the organic component so that everything dissolves, nothing is left. Okay. So here they will uh, follow this method. So after you sample with method five, then the particulate will be uh, collected and continue to method 29. So like I said, lah, uh, the, uh, the impinges to uh, 
to collect the uh, other gases to be measured. But as far as this uh, heavy metal is concerned, you will need to digest the uh, you need to digest the particulars, total particulars that you have uh, collected. And uh, just now, hydrogen peroxide will use, but at times that a stronger, a much more stronger oxidant is used, and this is potassium permanganate acidified. So it depends, lah. I mean, you can use a series of uh, oxidizers to destroy all these organic components. Uh, if I have the way, I will probably prevent myself, avoid from using uh, potassium permanganate, even though they are strong, they can be used, you can quantify. But I don't like the fact that potassium permanganate also contains heavy metal, manganese right here. Potassium is not, so okay lah, but manganese is here. Um, if you don't want the trouble to make this correction, you can also use hydrogen peroxide, yeah. So everything is the same, like digest, and you send it for ICP. ICP is inductively called coupled plasma. So that is the instrument to measure the concentration of heavy metals, all metals, all simultaneously. So that's why ICP is preferred, ICP MS or ICP OES. And the rest are up to your intervention. As long as you have an equipment to measure the concentration of heavy metal, it can be used. So we are now having 10 minutes left. So I'm going to conclude of today's lesson regarding emission air monitoring and also sampling. It is said that the online in-situ CEM is preferred, but for our subject that talks about, uh, what is it, sampling per se, you can say that in-situ CEM requires no sampling at all, but for the interest, okay, for the interest and the purpose of emission monitoring, in situ CEMS is preferred because obviously they measure real time and they give you fast results immediately. Because emission moves very fast, when it, when it exceeds the stack, then you are subjected to law enforcement. So that's why measuring real time, having quick results is very crucial in terms of uh, taking care of the emission lah, yeah. Uh, however, for various reasons, the extracted CEM is uh, uh, are performed, and this is where you have the sampling elements lah, yeah. So in this sampling, you will need to know the pitot tube, and also the grab sampler. I can say these are the two that involves directly lah, to our code. Yeah, sampling, sampling. These are the two major ones, and many more. Uh, preparation and preservation that involves they are very similar not exactly the same but very similar to the ambient air monitoring um, but yeah so these are the things that you have learned now very similar to ambient air with a little bit of difference um, but for more reference uh, there's one video that i discovered yesterday and it is published by indian institute of technology and it's a very good video. I strongly recommend you to go and watch this video. Uh, it's about hands-on usage of pitot tube on the extracted CEMS. So go have a look. Now the content of the theory is more or less of uh, what I have given earlier, if not more from my side. But what I like of this video is that they show the actual pitot tube connected to a pump, connected to the uh, the sampling tray. This is what I like. I, I strongly recommend you to have a look at that video. So with that, I think, uh, yeah, this one also coming from that slide. So have a look lah, on the different mathematical uh, formula that they use in order to calculate the sampling rate, the volume, the SCM volume and whatnot. So with that, uh, that is all from me.